Welcome to The Mothers, a podcast that centers the voices of women from across America whose children were killed by police. I'm independent journalist Georgia Fort. And I'm Nico Georgiatis from Unicorn Riot. Today, we hear from Marion Gray Hopkins, the mother of Gary Hopkins Jr. Gary was killed by police when he was just 19 years old. If you listen to episode one about the police killing of Archie Elliott III in 1993, then you're familiar with Prince George's County, because that's the same county where Gary was killed by police officers on November 27th, 1999. So so, so, so Gary, in addition to going to college full time, he worked a little part time job at a local nursing home and he was really struggling after the death of his father. And his supervisor was given a dance at the local fire station with all different age groups uh, attending this event. I mean, young, middle age and old were attending this dance. So the morning of the dance, Gary came and he laid down beside me in the bed. Uh, again, it's only 15, that, that time was only 15 days after his dad had passed away. And he says, Mom, you just don't understand. Not only was dad, was he my father, he was my best friend. He says, so Mom, he says, my supervisor invited me to a dance. He said, and I'm going to go. He said, maybe you should go too. So Gary decided to go. He was actually leaving the dance when he was confronted by the police. I get this phone call and I hear this girl on the phone and she's screaming and she's crying. And oh my God, they just shot Gary. They just shot Gary. And I'm thinking, what? I said, where are you? She says, we're at the fire station. We're at the fire station. So I get down to the fire station and everything's taped off. Um, I'm like, you know, I heard my son was shot and they says, well, this is a crime scene, ma'am. And the fire station was on one side of the street and just directly across the street was the hospital. And I said, you know, where's my son? And I said, so, so I hear his friends run up. Ma, they took him to the hospital. They took him to the hospital. And so, you know, I had to take a detour because they wouldn't even allow me across the tape. And so I get to the hospital and they wouldn't even allow me in the room where he was. And they said his whole entire body is evidence. So you can't see him. And I said, oh my God, you just, this is my son, I need to see him. And so, you know, they said, okay, we're gonna let you in the room, but you can't touch him. You know, I get to the hospital and I'm in the room and he's on, on, on the table, on a bed, and I could see him from a distance. And they had him covered up and, you know, I was unable to touch my son's warm body that day. And if anything bothers me more is I didn't get to touch my son while I, while, while I thought his body was still warm. So I get the story about what happened that night. Gary goes to the dance with his cousins, a lot of his friends, because he says, Mom, I'm going to call my cousins. I'm going to call my friends. Everybody's going. You should go, too. And I'm like, no, I'm not going. So they get to the dance. Everybody's having a great time. A little bit about Gary. Gary was always the leader of the group. He was a mentor to his peers. They all looked up to Gary, so he would always tell them what to do. So they're at this dance that night, and his friend gets into a verbal altercation, not a physical altercation, but a verbal altercation with somebody else at the party over a girl. Gary breaks it up. So he's a peacemaker that night. He breaks up the fight. Um, and then so there was three, they were three, four cars of loads of them. So they're all lined up in the cars and Gary got them in the cars. And he was a passenger in the, in the first, in the lead vehicle. He's a passenger in the back seat. Gary always playing jokes, joking around. The window is rolled down in the mid of, of winter and it's very cold in Maryland in the winter, November. So by this time it's November 27th after the dance. He's sitting on the outside ledge of the vehicle, legs dangling off the off the window and he's looking back to make sure everybody's in their respective cars still when a police officer comes and blocks them on the side that they were on there were two exits to the fire station one on the right one on the left they were at the left exit he comes and blocks them from exiting the fire station gets out of his patrol car with his gun already drawn he comes out of the patrol car puts that cold gun to gary's temple uh, witness will say he was moving his head about because the gun was to his head and he pulls Gary off the ledge of that car by the collar of his shirt. Gary falls, he's stumbling, he's falling backwards. The second officer that was moonlighting at the event that night comes and makes one fatal gunshot wound to Gary's chest. The officer who shot Gary was initially indicted. Yep, he was indicted, but 
then he was acquitted, and then no charges were filed on the officer that actually precipitated the incident. We got an indictment. We were one of the considered one of the fortunate families. We got an indictment against the police officers. I'm very green at the time, not knowing that we got a, a effed up system, that there is no justice for us, that was is just us. I'm, I'm figuring, you know, they're going to do the right thing. They wrongfully, just unjustly killed my son. We're going to get the justice that we deserve. So there was a state's attorney that felt very strongly that my son was wrongfully killed. What they did was they indicted the police officer that did the fatal shooting, but they didn't indict the police officer that precipitated the event, who lied under oath, was given the statements of all the witnesses that night, 10 days later gave his statement that of course was gonna align with the narrative that was given the night of the murder. My son lunged at him. He feared for his life. The other officer was protecting the officer who he was trying to take the gun from. There was drugs and weapons in the car. All of the narratives that you hear today, this is 20 years ago. It is so scripted because today those same stories that I heard 20 years ago are being said today. Nothing has changed. And, and so we went to trial. The, the state's attorney who indicted my son was going to, was, he, was, um, he was a politician, if you will. He wanted to become what the next step in our community was, the county executive of Prince George's County. So he used my family as a political pawn to become the next county executive because he's, I'm the first state's attorney that has ever charged an officer in uniform for killing a civilian. And so we went to trial. He put a very junior prosecuting team together. The lead prosecutor had never tried a murder case before. One was just getting out of law school. But we know that the union, the police union, is going to hire the best of the best to protect those that have, are paid to protect and serve us. And so we went through a seven-day trial with the judge that slept through most of the trial. And as we went through the days and the judge not allowing key evidence that would have convicted this officer, we knew going into it that we, this was a lost case for, for us. We were not going to win this case against this, this officer. The officer who precipitated the event lied under oath. I was told they were going to indict him for perjury. They never did. All of this to say, this is a system that is corrupt, corrupt. that needs to be dismantled, dismantled and revamped. And revamped. No peace. No justice. Police. No justice. No peace. No racism. Police. Police. So, Nico, when we spoke with Marion, it was originally at a banquet for mothers whose mm -hmm. children were killed by police in Minneapolis. She comes to this banquet each and every year. Did she share with you why she flies all the way from Maryland to Minneapolis every year for this banquet? Yeah, she's shared a lot. And, and some of the things that she also shared with that was being a part of Coalition for Concerned Mothers, which is a group, of, a family support group for families who've lost their loved ones to police terror, police violence. She's shared how growing that community out east is also imperative to see it growing in the Midwest. And so this banquet you bring up is Cordell Handy Banquet brought together by Kim Handy Jones, who mm -hmm. lost Cordell uh, to police killings. In uh, 2017. 2017 yeah. by St. Paul Police, yep. who's the most deadly police force in Minnesota. Mm. And um, she brings together families from across the nation who've lost their loved ones. Yeah. Um, Marion is part of the board for the Cordell Handy Q Foundation. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. And so now that she, so she's on the board, she helps out with uh, the, the banquet who actually gives headstones to family members who've lost their loved ones who can't pay for the expenses for burial costs or just having a headstone. And so it's been, it's, that was one of the most uh, touching things for me to hear, mm -hmm. talking to, hear her talking about how she lost her loved one, but then also is now giving back to those who also lost their loved one and providing these support systems. And so we, we heard from her um, talking about some of this importance. I'm here today to support Kimberly Handy Jones, who is doing a phenomenal job. This is a beautiful, amazing event. I come to stand in solidarity with Kim and the rest of the mothers and fathers and just loved ones across the nation to include siblings to say that we are in this fight together. We're going to win this fight together. 
and to say that myself and the Coalition of Concerned Mothers, which is an organization that I started and co-founded with another mother, to say that, you know, we must love on one another. This event is just amazing. It gives us an opportunity to talk about our loved ones. We know we're in a space, in a place where we know each other's pain. We want to help Kim in getting money. She's doing phenomenal things, uh, giving back to the community, helping those who would otherwise not be able to afford headstones for their loved ones. So we want you all to support the Cordell Q. Handy Foundation and also help the Coalition of Concerned Mothers, which is an organization that I'm working on. We travel across the nation to support one another because, again, we know each other's pain. We want to be working on legislation uh, to stop these officers from being able to get away with murder of our loved ones. And just, it's, I'm just trying to think of so many different things that we can do. But again, just being there for one another, it just means so much when you have been impacted. So, you know, uh, traveling, supporting one another, just doing those things that we know otherwise would not happen. Would not happen. I wanted to draw back in the episode one with Dorothy Cop Elliott. When she was talking about her son, Archie Elliott, you know, that was in 1993. Mm-hmm. Mary and Gray Hopkins was talking about her son in 1999. Yeah. That's 22 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it was a much different time because when you, you think back to the 90s, this was before officers were required to wear body cameras. This was before cell phone devices were equipped with cameras. And so a lot of these incidents that happened in the 90s they, they transpired without any video evidence to support or uh, refute the claims of the officers. And so in the 90s, when you had these families who were coming forward and saying that, hey, look, the evidence is not matching the narrative of the police, there was no footage to support their claims. And so it was a lot easier uh, for the media and for communities to just fully buy into what the police were, were saying without there being you know, any true objection to that. And also, Nico, I think it's important to note that uh, these um, cases happened before Black Lives Matter. Uh, before the Black Lives Matter movement was, you know, really developed and created. And so when you don't have that support from the community and you don't have any uh, video evidence for Black families specifically, it was extremely challenging, if not impossible, to really go up against this system uh, and 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 advocate for any kind of justice for your child if they're killed by police. Mm-hmm. And as you heard what Marion said, you know, she thought she said she was coming green into this. She was green coming into this. She thought that they would be able to get justice. You know, it was sort of an open shut case. A fight was going on at a party. He broke the fight up. Mm-hmm. He's hanging out the window. They're leaving, and he's the one who gets pulled off of the car by the officer, puts a gun in his head. And then the off-duty officer is the one who shoots him. And so it's like almost this open and shut. You would think that you would get some accountability from at least the off-duty officer who did pull the trigger on the young man who didn't have a gun. Yeah, yeah. But if you don't have video evidence, then it's your word against their word. And in the 90s, they just didn't have the same policies. They weren't required to have the body cameras uh, on. It wasn't even a thing in the 90s. But, you know, Nico, even reflecting on more current cases, like the case of Philando Castile, when there was footage and it still wasn't enough to produce accountability. So while we reflect on these cases from the 90s that maybe people aren't as familiar with, it's also important to think about how the times have changed. Uh, But even with (laughs) the requirement and the recommendation that police departments utilize body camera footage it still sometimes doesn't produce the accountability that families are seeking that's very true and on the topic of accountability you have to look at the legal uh, ramifications of either side and and who's providing legal counsel Mm -hmm. for the families and that's been a consistent similarity that we've seen throughout this documentary series that we're producing on the mothers a lot of these moms have 
um, sometimes insufficient legal counsel or sometimes a, a legal counsel that will you know pass away in the middle of a case yeah. as what happened to Dorothy Cobb Elliott right. or when you have Marion Gray Hopkins where there's you think it's an open and shut case and they no justice able to, they're not able to get justice and that's mostly because of not only the police unions and and the way we've been talking about the cover-ups and whatnot and the, and the evidence lacking but it's also because of um, the legal counsel sometimes doesn't have enough to utilize uh, within the laws uh, anything that will be able to be brought against as a charge or as a consequence for criminal liability against the police officers for taking another's life. Absolutely. Well, coming up, we're going to hear from Marion and how she's turned her pain into power. That's coming up after this. Listening to the mothers with Marion Gray Hopkins, whose son was killed in 1999 by police in Prince George's County, Maryland. Before we wrap up today's episode, we close with inspiration by Marion. Like many of the mothers we've interviewed, she's also been able to find purpose in her pain. Since Marion's son was killed, she's become an activist against police terrorism. She co founded the Coalition of Concerned Mothers. Still, I have turned my pain into a, a purpose, into a plan to, to, make, to bring changes. Will it happen in my lifetime? Probably not. But I'm setting the groundwork and the framework and the foundation that would allow those that come behind me something that they can build on. Because we cannot continue to allow them to just unjustly and wrongfully murder our children and do nothing and say nothing. My voice will be heard and it will continue to be heard until I can no longer speak. I vowed to my son to do that. One of the things that drives me is my husband on his deathbed. He told me, he says, you know, going down his last breath, he took that mask off. And he says, you are a soldier. You have always been a soldier. My son, the day he died. Before he left that day, one of the other things he told me, he says, Ma, you, Daddy was right. You are such a soldier. You are the strongest woman I have ever known. And that is part of my drive. I will continue to be a soldier and I will continue to fight. And that's my story. And that's my story. Thank you for listening to the Mother's Podcast. You can find all of the episodes at unicornriot.ninja forward slash the mothers. And to find out more about my work as an independent journalist, head over to my website, georgiafort.com. You can follow my work, Nico Georgiatis, at Mr. Nico G on social media and nicog.work. Audio recording and engineering by Malcolm Wells. You can find my work at stonywells.com and at stonywells on social media. 
S-T-O-N-Y-W-E-L-L-Z. What up? This is Longshot, and I provided the raps for the Mother's Podcast. You can support me and my work at mclongshot.com. Peace. My name is Tariq Thornton. I help edit and produce along with DJ Skiz for Different Worlds Music Group. Peace. My name is DJ Skiz. I made all the beats as well as did the mixing and editing of the Mother's Podcast. You can check me out on social media at DJ Skiz, DJ S-K-I-Z-Z, or at DJSkizBeats.com. You could also follow Unicorn Riot across social media platforms and find our work at UnicornRiot.Ninja. Unicorn Riot is a 501c3 educational nonprofit media organization dedicated to engaging and amplifying the stories of social and environmental struggles from the ground up. Support our work at UnicornRiot.Ninja slash donate. Part of the funding for this podcast is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.